I'm in the Corvette Museum's archives looking through material on Claire McKeegan. He headed the Chevrolet studio from 52 to 62. And look at this. You know, we've talked about other car guys, Hall of Famers, like Chuck Jordan, who used to doodle on the edges of their notebook. But how often do you get to see the school day drawings of famous designers? And here's a McKeegan original. Talk about a car guy. This is an English report from 1934. And speaking of school, here's a quiz. Is this grill Ferrari or Chevy? We could say Ferrari influenced. We always have a foreign car in the display in the museum because in Europe, that's what, what the GIs were seeing running around the, the streets. Uh, in the United States, when Chevrolet produced the Corvette, it was to take the place of many of those uh, foreign cars. Harley Earl liked to travel to Europe where he picked up ideas. This is a clear example of Harley Earl working with Claire McKeegan to produce an American icon. And here's another. As we've seen, Claire grew up in the 20s, the days of form-following function in American mass-produced auto design. In the service of an easily produced boxy shape, design was merely a metal skin to cover the technology. The cars were, were boxes, really. We, we design cars in an entirely different way. You design them usually in a side view first, and a front view, and a rear view, and then uh, the other view would just sort of fall into place. But by the 50s, another influence was taking place. In 1951, the Museum of Modern Art had an exhibit entitled Eight Automobiles. There were no mass-produced American cars, just expensive cars like Mercedes and Bentley, and at the other end of the spectrum, functional cars like the MG. The comment was made that American cars were not chosen because of their nouveau riche glitter, while the MG Roadster had an honesty in design without the pretentiousness of excess decoration. And one of the exhibit cars, the Cistalia 202 Fiberglass. We know Harley Earl was, shall we say, strongly opinionated. When we made drawings on vertical boards, full size, uh, I, this is all cars and things, I mean, Her Harley might say, I think it's a little bit high, so take it down a little bit, and he's talking about, I don't know, a half an inch or something like that. The guys would take it down a quarter of an inch, and he'd say, you guys didn't move it very much, did you? But we also know he liked to borrow ideas. Another thing, keep in mind that in these days, no one person was allowed to take credit for a single accomplishment. But we do know Claire is responsible for starting the Chevy studio in the early 50s. So wrap all this up, the European influence, competitive spirit, and fiberglass curves. And you have the perfect stage for the debut of the Corvette. And while this Corvette may have been Harley Earl's edict, it was up to Claire to make it happen, even down to the finest detail. There was a little seam in there, and that seam showed. And he said that we got to take that off there. And so I had the guys come in with the cutter and cut that off, and we riveted it to the inside of that uh, the wheelhouse opening. I remember that. That's to keep the water from going up over to make the water go the other way. He would suggest minute changes till it got to be what he thought was right. And generally when he thought it was right, Bill Mitchell and Harley both thought it was right also. And so that was the design of the original Corvette. We redid some things in there to get so we get better production that way. So we wouldn't have to take the cars in. And also, uh, we, we made a uh, uh, machine that you hooked down there, and we could spin the wheel, and it would tell us if there was any rubbing in any place. That our, our ears wouldn't pick it up. Nobody at GM knew what a two-passenger sports car should look like. It was, we were making something that was brand new, and uh, and it turned out fine. But I mean, nobody knew what it should look like. It, it was just a interesting design. We went through several phases of what it ought to look like and, and we all know what it ended up looking like. Uh, he, was, he, was, he was thorough. 
He wouldn't take no lip from you, it's like that, but he, he, was, he was fair. Mac was a good designer and, and I think a good manager. He was the boss and Harley was his boss, so when McKeegan was happy and he could show it to Harley and if Harley was happy, then it was a pretty good design. Well, I, I always had a great deal of respect for Mac and uh, he was easy to work with most of the time. I recall one particular incident where for some reason he had a bad day and he really got down on everybody in the studio. But I will say this for him, the next morning when we came into work, he called everybody together and he apologized. And uh, there are few that would do that. And that's the only, only time I ever recall anything like that and I, I still don't know to this day what, what it was that, that upset him. Might have been Harley Earl. <laughs> Claire McKeegan was a nice man to work for, a very good designer. Each studio in those days only had four or five people in them. So, I mean, uh, Claire didn't just casually walk in and out. I mean, he was a designer that was working on the job. Design staff there really didn't amount to much, and uh, they didn't have a great deal of authority. Well, Mac changed all that. He was, he was a clear man who really thought with his head Working with Mac, Joe Shemansky, his assistant, and the other studio personnel, was, it was a really pleasant experience. He expected a lot of work from you, he expected things from you, but he was willing to uh, go to bat for you if there's things. I remember one particular time in the studio, I did a huge rendering of an advanced car, and uh, Mac had it mounted on a piece of plywood and mounted above the drawing boards in the studio. Well, that was a no-no. You were never supposed to put anything above there. But he did and he got away with it. So he would go to bat for you with different things and, and he, was a, he was a good guy to work with both uh, at work and on the outside too. Was, Mac uh, always was close to the Corvette even after he retired. He spoke to many, many car groups around the United States. His interest in the Corvette never waned. There was always a Corvette parked in his garage. I think uh, the last time I was there, just before he died, he still had a, he had a new Corvette in the garage. So he was really a Corvette guy. A word you often hear when talking about any culture is icon. Not just in the car culture, but in American culture as well. And when you realize that Claire is responsible for the 55 Chevy, the 57 Chevy, and the 50s Corvette, wow! Ladies and gentlemen, our second inductee into the 2011 Corvette Hall of Fame, Claire McKeekin. Claire uh, Mac McKicken will be our uh, General Motors, um, as you can tell from the video, inductee, and uh, his family's here to accept for him. Sparky. reads for uh, Claire Mac McKicken for his outstanding accomplishments and significant contributions to the Corvette. Induction to the Corvette Hall of Fame, September 1st, 2011. Congratulations. That video is fabulous. We have so much to learn about what Dad did, because we were just little tykes. I guess we could be children of the Corvette, as opposed to father of the Corvette. Um, personally, I remember washing Corvettes during Michigan football games, or 
waiting for that the very painful process of putting the top down, the ritualistic thing. <laughs> Why men get upset that women are not getting ready to go anywhere fast enough, but when the guy's got to take the top down on the vet, you just take a chair. It just takes forever. <laughs> or the best thing, watching mom get dressed and figure out what she's going to do with the hair so she looks like she's supposed to be going where she's going. Will it be a hat? Do you tie it up? Do you put your head down between your knees while you're traveling down the street? <laughs> so the, whole, the video is great. I mean, there was really something for um, a kid from Applegate, Michigan, whose father was a mailman. I mean, where did this all come from? It just kind of came out of nowhere. So we really see the, the, the award is a tribute to a guy who really got to do exactly what he wanted to do all of his life. But I think I'd like to also make a tribute to his wife, Edie, who somehow held us all together while Dad was working his heart out and getting all these things to happen. So thank you to the committee, the Hall of Fame, and Sparky. Sparky's our hero. He's been part of our family for a long time. So thank you so much. Appreciate it.